Hey, I'm Chris Stoy and I'm here with Ray Foreman and we're part of the Warriors for Justice team. Today, we're gonna to talk about what to expect from a client's perspective when it comes to trial. Uh, I think that we've kind of boiled it down to 10 things that you can expect to see at trial and we'll go through those, but just for references purposes, it's uh, Vordire, which means? It's French, it means to speak the truth. Okay, so Vordire, opening statements, plaintiff's case in chief, motion for directed verdict, defendant's case in chief, rebuttal, closing arguments, instructing the jury, deliberations, and verdict. Before we get to any of those stages though, I wanna to talk to you about pre-trial. A pre-trial conference typically happens in a smaller personal injury wreck on the day of the trial, maybe an hour or two before. On bigger cases, sometimes the judge will have us come down a week before or a few days before so that we can go over things. Certain things that we go over in pre-trial include a motion in limine, which is a motion to exclude or prevent the opposing side from talking about certain things, um, exhibit list, witness list, what else? Qualifications of experts. Qualifications of experts, sometimes deposition designations. Oh yeah. So let's talk about those. So motion, and again, we're meaning to keep this at a very um, layperson level and we don't mean to get off in the weeds too much, but motion and limine, uh, we're gonna file something saying like, hey, they shouldn't be able to talk about, and maybe we have 50 motions, little bitty motions in limine saying, anything from they shouldn't be able to talk about our clients wreck 15 years ago, they shouldn't be able to talk about our clients divorce two years ago, just a number of different things. The defense will say, well, they sh the plaintiff shouldn't be able to talk about insurance, shouldn't be able to mention uh, yada, yada, yada. We'll have gone back in the room with the defense lawyer and come to an agreement on the majority of these. They're pretty much formulaic at this point. Same thing with exhibits, we'll have list all the things that we intend to offer at trial, the defense will do the same. And because we're all practicing attorneys, we have a general understanding of what undoubtedly the judge will let in versus what is questionable. If we disagree on what's admissible, we'll take it before the judge later at the actual pretrial hearing. Same thing with kind of the witnesses. Uh, there's not much argument on witnesses that can be called versus ones that can't. And as Rafe mentioned, the experts and their qualifications. And that's typically, if you've hired an expert, no one's going to agree They're like, oh yeah, I just won't call my expert. But the judge does like to see that we try to work some things out. So that's pre-trial and that's done before the trial, obviously, maybe an hour and a half before. Now, before we get into those 10 things though, I do wanna add, you're watching this video because your case is most likely going to trial. So I wanna make sure that you know that you need to be brushed and polished and ready to go when you're at trial. You know, I'm not saying that you have to wear a tuxedo by any means or even a suit. Not everybody wears suits. You wear what fits your character, but it needs to be nice. And you need to be groomed. You need to appear presentable. Uh, don't come in in shorts. Don't come in something too revealing. What are your pet peeves on dress? Uh, it's distracting to anybody to, you know, they just keep looking at you. Uh, don't be distracting. Don't wear gaudy jewelry. Don't wear big rings. Uh, don't wear fancy bling. Yeah. Don't wear the uh, Bluetooth things that are all interconnected. If you get on the stand with a Bluetooth device in your ear, I may quit, okay? Yeah. I'm serious. Cover your feet. I don't want to see sandals. Yeah. Uh, and just, yeah, do that. Pack something to eat, maybe bring bring some water just so you'll have it. And arrive to court early. And know that, you know, I'll be in the jury room talking with opposing counsel about pretrial. And just be comfortable. There's something about arriving to the courthouse with enough time that you can kind of breathe and take in the atmosphere and get over maybe those little jitters and just feel it for a little bit before you step in. Don't talk in the court in the court period yeah don't talk in the hallways don't argue with the people that are running you through security don't act like a fool because you're coming in with the jurors and they're going to see how you really act act presentable and don't be talking to anybody don't be talking about your case don't be big dogging it 
mm-hmm. running your mouth, talking big, bold in the elevator, being critical of anybody. All these things have happened, which is why I mention them. Don't be one of those that goes on our next video. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that because the jury trial starts from the minute you leave your house that morning. That means the minute you pull out of the driveway, don't cut someone off, don't flip someone off, just even if they deserve it, because you never know that person could be on your jury. And the last thing you wanna do is walk in and see that person. I mean, can you imagine how white you would get if a person sitting there that's about to determine whether you get compensated for your harms and losses as someone that you flipped off and yelled at earlier that morning? Just don't do it. I agree. <laughs> It'll happen though. Don't spit on the sidewalk, open the doors, just be able to- Throw your trash down yeah. and not pick it up. Do what your mama taught you to do. Correctly. Well, maybe not. I don't know your mom. <laughs> okay. Do what Good we're point. telling you to do. Act right. Good point. So <laughs> let's talk about Vordire, and I'm going to kick that over to Rafe. If you can just kind of give a lay person's overview of what Vordire is so that our clients know what to expect. Lawyers love to say Vordire, and they claim it's Latin. They don't even know what they're talking about. It's French. We're not going to talk about Vordire. You don't need to know what that word means. It's jury selection. No, it's not. Let me scratch that out and get that out of your mind. It's jury deselection. We don't get to pick who's on our jury. We get to knock off about six of the bad people that we think are going to be bad for our case. So it's jury deselection. Here's what I need you to do. I don't want you to tell me, oh, I got a bad feeling about this. I wouldn't date that person. I'm talking about, I've got a bad feeling this person doesn't seem very empathetic. Doesn't seem like he would listen to the case, falling asleep. Rolled his eyes. Rolls his eyes, laughs and makes fun of you every time you talk, which you'll see a lot of that. So when I'm up there talking, you be watching for people that are rolling their eyes or sneering or making fun of me because, frankly, that happens a lot. Um, I also need for you to be watching for body language of the jurors and writing it down. We're going to get in a, a debate in the back room if you tell me juror number three did so-and-so in the in the jury deselection i want to see where you wrote it down so i can get what you wrote in the moment not what you recall two or three hours later and it's very important your input but i want you to be able to defend it because we're going to be able to defend ours i'm going to have copious notes of why i want to get rid of somebody and it's okay to tell us who you favor but we don't get to pick those. I'm very much more interested in who you're deathly afraid of or who you think is a Nazi, for example. You know, So that's what I need for you to do in Vordire. Now, where do you sit? How do you act? What do you do? You're the plaintiff. You're the star of the show. You get to sit at council table between Chris and I or beside Chris and I. We'll be facing the jury panel. Now, here's the problem. Uh, they're sitting down, you're sitting down, and so you can't really see who's in the back row on the fifth, fifth row back there. You can lean over, you can't stand up, but my practice in Vordire is I've gotten to where I have the jurors stand up so we can see from everybody on the table can see whether they're talking. I just need you to really pay close attention and watch what's going on. Here's the next thing. Chris and I are going to be focused on the case, the law, and the judge. We need you to be watching the jury. When, they, when the judge tells them they can go out in the hall for a restroom break, we want you to tell us who's talking to each other. We want you to watch when they go to lunch and tell us who goes to lunch together because those are important relationships and alliances that are already being formed. And we might not be watching because we may be getting uh, in an argument with opposing counsel or talking to the judge. We need you to keep watching that jury. Yeah. So each judge has different time limits on board hours. Sometimes in a federal court case, it could be as little as 15 minutes. Other Which cases, is terrible. Yeah, it is. And wrong. <laughs> Other cases, it could be an hour, two hours. I've seen cases that go for board hour for days, right? I've not actually done one, but I've board hour enough juries, and those are typically two hours in a car wreck case. Um, so after the plaintiff's lawyer does for dire and ask questions, the defense lawyer will get up and have the same amount of time to ask questions as, as well. Then the judge will excuse the veneer panel, which is the actual, they're not jurors at this point, they're just veneer members. Mm-hmm. They'll excuse the panel and the attorney, your attorney will be able to make challenges for cause, which 
uh, briefly, challenge for cause. A challenge for cause is a jury who is bringing bias and prejudice from outside the courtroom into this courtroom and is going to judge the merits of this case based on something other than the evidence presented in the trial. And so we're going to be using your notes and the observations that we made during voir dire to determine who should be challenged for cause. The judge will either grant it or he'll deny it, but then we have what's called peremptory challenges where we get to strike a veneer member for any reason as long as it isn't one of the protected classes of uh, age, race, uh, gender else? identity, gender. Gender. gender, yeah all those. Um, we have to have a neutral National reason. orientation. Uh, yeah, <laughs> all those reasons that we can't strike. But it could be that the guy just looked at us wrong. We didn't like that. And we'll typically use those on ones where we lose the challenge for cause because it clearly indicates that we don't like that. Then, after all the challenges have been made, now the, mind you, these people will be seated one through whatever, 42, and say juror number one and number two is struck, or veneer member number one and two is struck, the judge will call out the first in county court six jurors that are left, and in district court, the first 12 that are left. So if one and two have been struck by whatever method, whether it's challenge for cause or peremptory, number three becomes juror number one, and it just keeps going down the line. Then we got our juror set, right? right? The judge then panels them where he reads this lengthy, uh, thing and in Texas still includes instructions not to look on MySpace and that's how outdated that one is. And usually we it take used to be don't read the newspaper or watch TV. <laughs> yeah, and they're instructed by the way not to like ride the elevator down with us, not take any favors from the defense, and so we inst we kind of instruct you make sure you don't get on the elevator. And we're not saying be rude to the jurors by any means, but we don't want to create any opportunities that could potentially look like impropriety. So that's right. I've noticed, I think, that everyone kind of understands, the jurors understand, the parties understand, look, hey, we're not getting on the elevator. It's not because we think you stink. It's because we just don't want to do anything the wrong way. That's right. Be polite. Let them go. Step aside. Let them be in the elevator and you don't get in there with them. Let me tell you something else not to do. Uh, you go home at night and you say, okay, we got these six jurors. I'm going to start Facebooking them. I'm going to start looking them up online. And, uh, hey, I, I think I know this person. Do not do that. Or friend them or anything. Don't, yeah, don't, don't do friend that. them. That's unethical. And we'll get in trouble for your actions, so don't be doing that. Yeah. Just leave the uh, social media alone from the time, the, tr the day before the trial starts till the day it's over. Yeah. Don't post anything either during trial. Yeah. Uh, now we'll move on after voir dire. Typically there's a break taken. Maybe it's only 15 minutes. Maybe we go to lunch, but then we come back and we do opening statements. Generally you're allowed 15, 20 minutes for opening statements. Opening statements are list limited to what we expect the facts to show. So we can't make argument and there's a fine line between that. And sometimes we'll draw an objection if we argue too much. But basically, we're summing up what we expect to prove to the jury. I agree. That's the function of an opening statement. I'm incapable of making a statement without argument, evidently, because <laughs> everybody on the other side objects. But if I tell you that I expect the evidence is going to show, that's not an argument. That's what I'm doing for opening statement. But I'm going to tell a story in this opening statement that we're going to deliver in our case in chief because whoever has the most credible story is going to win this trial and we're going to have the most credible story and so you will have heard this story hopefully before your trial because i'm going to vet it with you we're going to give this opening to you let you read it let you talk about it correct any misunderstandings we may have because there's a problem with opening statement and it's called over promising we don't want to over promise if we say it's going to happen, we want it to happen. If I tell you it's Easter, you can go home and paint your eggs. <laughs> and so bottom line is I need the opening to be correct. And so I want your feedback before trial. I want you to re read it, edit it, and tell me this is a little bit, th this is not exactly true because I want it to be exactly true. 
Opening statement is the second most important element in the trial. Vore Dyer is first. You, can, you win or lose your trial in Vore Dyer. You can lose it at any stage, but opening is so important because opening sets the scene and tells the jury what's going to be important and what to watch for. Yeah, I agree, and I've heard that from many experienced trial lawyers is that opening Vore Dyer is when you win the, win the trial. So. Seen it happen too. Me too. So the next thing we'll move into is the plaintiff's case in chief, and this is where the actual evidence is presented. So up until this point, nothing is evidence. Now there's issues that can be created that are appealable, but I'm going to set that aside. Uh, plaintiff's case in chief is where we put on evidence, and evidence consists of testimony, and it consists of like documentary evidence, medical records, police reports, mm, pictures different things that we've collected diagrams. diagrams all kinds of stuff and we'll start since we have the burden of proof we will start with putting on a witness and it just depends it's, it's a, always a tactical decision as to who we are putting on first sometimes and often we will put on the defense or the defendant first because they are the they tend to be the villain of the story other times for whatever reason we will put the plaintiff on first put you on first We'll have you testify, go through some medical records. We may call a doctor to testify. We may call that doctor via video that we've already done from a video deposition and play that video for an hour. After each witness that we call, and we're calling on direct examination, after each witness, the defendant's attorney is allowed to cross-examine that witness through what's called cross-examination. and. Uh, given pr pretty big latitude for cross-examination, right? As a matter of fact, every judge in Texas I've ever practiced in front of says, counsel, we have wide open cross That's in Texas. That's right, yeah. And that means anything goes. Anything goes. And then after the defense is done with cross-examination, we can redirect, meaning clear up anything that they addressed on cross. Now, it is a limited redirect, right? You're limited on the questions that you ask on redirect that have to be covered in a cross. So there is a proper objection outside the scope of cross and the judge will cut you off. You, can, you can't redirect on what you forgot to do on direct. Yeah. You redirect on what issues were raised up on the cross. And the judge is pretty strictly enforced. They are. So we've gone through our witnesses. We've put the plaintiff on. Sometimes uh, the, we'll not put the defense on in a, in a certain case, anticipating that the defendant will put the defendant on in their case in chief. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Mm -hmm. But after we've put on our case in chief, all our evidence, enough that we feel is sufficient to prove the elements of our case, meaning that if nothing else happened, we feel that we could win the case, we will do what's called rest. And then we make a motion for directed verdict, which 99% of the time is denied. Uh, but we're basically saying, judge, we've proven that the plaintiff uh, or that the defendant was negligent and that, those neg that negligent act caused our plaintiff's injuries and that our plaintiff sustained these damages and therefore judge you, not the jury, should grant a directed verdict for the plaintiff. Right. The verdict is what we're asking the defendant or the jury to render later as opposed to the judgment. We'll talk about that more in a little the bit. The verdict is the ultimate ruling in the trial. I want to add one thing. Um, Chris and I went to law school to learn about trial strategy. You don't need to worry about witness order. We arm wrestle, debate. Witness order is a huge thing. Let me tell you all you need to know about witness order. The order of the witnesses and the order of the evidence is going to be in the way that we have mutually decided best tells your story. And that's that may, all you need to worry about. And that may come after a lot of uh, fights about it, too. I mean, just at lunch today, we've no. got trial Wednesday, and we're still debating, and we'll continue to debate the witness order, I bet, up until that trial starts. Because Rafe has his thoughts, I have mine, and it's just we're not saying either one is wrong. We're looking for the best solution for you, uh, and that's what we'll be deciding there. And one thing I agree on is there's no cookie cutter. This is the way you always do it. Every case is unique, and every case we have to examine it to see which witness order and which evidence order best tells our story yeah that's both of our goal so after we've after our motion for directed verdict has been denied the defense will be allowed to put on their case in chief most of their case in chief will have been brought 
in ours through the cross-examination of our witnesses. But if, for example, they have experts that they want to call to contest our or rebut our experts, they're allowed to do that. They can, if we haven't called the defendant to give his version of how the wreck happened or how the termination happened, they can call the defendant and put him on. And after every direct examination, we're allowed to cross-examine their witnesses just like they were allowed to cross-examine ours. And then redirect happens just the same. Um, then I guess we get rebuttal after that. If we if do on, one thing rare, that, but sometimes one thing I want them to think about, you know, those depositions that you went to and you talked in front of the court reporter, the defense may choose to read in your parts of your deposition or the defendant's deposition or another witness's deposition instead of calling that person live saves time. It's boring as ever, but we just want you to understand that that is an acceptable practice when when you gave your deposition it was just like you were testifying in front of this jury whether it was by video or merely merely oral and so just know that they can do that yeah at that point um, all the evidence has been completed the defendants will rest and then will both parties will close they'll say we close meaning that the evidence portion of the case is over no more evidence and i can't remember the exact order in federal court but in uh state court we will then work with the judge on crafting the jury instructions that yep. are going to be read to the jury so the jury will kind of be dismissed they'll go out in the hall or maybe they'll even go home for the evening and we'll sit there with the judge and that we've got these forms for jury instructions it's what the jury the jury questions and the the judge, we, we all pretty much know now in really complex cases, we may have objections about what's being presented to the jury, but in a general car wreck case, we all pretty much agree that this question, this instruction should be submitted, this question should be submitted, and if we have any issues, we object, but the judge ultimately rules. Yeah, I've seen charge conferences last seven, eight hours. Uh, the jury's, you know, sent home again. Um, but it's important that we get these right. These are the roadmap and the instructions that the jury has to find liability or not find liability and put damages. So we gotta have them exactly right. I'm glad you said that. I think sometimes I underestimate how important that is. For example, we may be arguing over whether the judge puts the word injury versus occurrence in the instruction. And I've seen cases that I swear would have turned out differently had the judge have put occurrence as opposed to injury or vice versa. So mm -hmm. it, it is very important, and I don't mean to underplay. Um, you as the plaintiff will have no participation in this. No, but I, I'm trying to give you a, a, an alert. You may wonder, what are y'all doing all yeah. this time? Are y'all yeah. playing golf? Do you go to lunch with the judge, or what are you doing? We are literally trying to get every comma, every period, every word yeah. correct. And in some cases, it's at a time where it's maybe at the end of the day and we'll just tell you you can go on home because we know that it's going to take a while right. and there's not going to be any more trial today. Yep. So okay, we've got the jury instructions and the charge set and it's time for closing arguments. What I sometimes for me is uh, the most nerve wracking but also sometimes the most fun thing to do. So this is where we get to, you know, this is the things you see in the movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can take it from here. Well. Closing argument, you know, Jerry Spence says if you don't win your, if you hadn't won your case by closing argument, it's too late. I don't know, respectfully, Mr. Spence, if I agree with that 100% of the time. I've seen a lot of people take a case out of the fire and turn it around and close an argument. Closing argument is where you get to bring together what we've spent all this trial doing and and really make argument. You know, it's not to re-sum summarize the evidence that the jury has heard for a week. It's to argue how that means you win. Because you didn't hire us to come in here and lose. You hired us to get justice. Well, what does that mean? It means you hired us for you to win. And so closing argument is one of those important elements. Now, lawyers love it the most because you have the greatest leeway and the greatest latitude, you get the least objections, it's the most persuasive, most advocacy you're gonna see in a trial. The problem is if the jury's already made up their mind, it's too late. You're not gonna change their mind most likely in closing. 
what you're doing is you're playing to the jurors who have not yet decided. Mm -hmm. And closing often moves those jurors into a decision position. So closing is 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 so important, and it's and it's fun. Um, Every lawyer wants to do closing. Yeah, it's what you see where people get animated or maybe they get emotional. And I, as a lawyer, when I'm really attached to a case, I mean, I've, I've shed a tear in closing arguments just because it's, I mean, it's the culmination of emotion that we've put in for years on your case. Yep. And here we're finally getting to turn it over to a jury. So it can be, it can be very emotional. And just in discussing that, I, I wanted, it brought up an idea or something that we need to tell you all about. And that's what do we want our clients during doing during the trial, right? So, if you're falling asleep, you're going to get a hard elbow. And if you're if my partner Susan's next to you and you're yawning, she may punch you in the face. I mean, I she gets on to me if I'm if I don't if I like try to hide it poorly. Um, I agree. Don't be drinking vodka out of your water bottle. <laughs> don't do that. We've had that happen. <laughs> don't do that. Don't be dozing off into space. Um, I, I was always told like during mock trial, and I don't know if I do this, but that as a lawyer, when my, when my co-counsel is going, I should watch them because it's intriguing. And then when the defense lawyer is going or opposing counsel is going, that I should just be looking down. Um, that's mock trial. But what about for our clients in terms of trial, should they be watching the defendant's attorney? Should they be watching us? What do you think? I don't think you should be doing it. I don't think there's any hard and fast recipe. I don't want you watching, and every time uh, the defense counsel does something, you go. Oh, yeah. I mean, jurors hate that. You cannot be having those reactions. You can't be shaking your head, and if we see you doing that, we're going to ask for a little time out, and you and I are going to the woodshed. And the woodshed is where if you don't understand the questions, we whack you with a piece of wood till you get it. <laughs> Not really. That's a metaphorical term. But you cannot be having negative reactions to defense counsel. If you can't control yourself, then busy yourself doing something else. I'll tell you how important this is. Some lawyers, I'm not one of them, believe you only bring your plaintiff to the courtroom when he testifies or she testifies and he's out the rest of the time. I don't believe that. Uh, I don't buy that at all because if I may just speak plainly with you, if you're give a shitter's broke, mine is too. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't care enough to be present and attentive for your own case, well, I don't know how we can ask the jury to do different. So I agree. Sometimes I'm, I myself, even though I've tried a decent number of cases, start to get nervous about cross-examining a witness or directing a witness. And I imagine that my client gets nervous as well, uh, preparing to give their directed or the direct statement or their, or their examination. A um, little tip that I like to do sometimes is I will sit there and write out the words to Don't Stop Believing by Journey. I don't know why, but just like just a small town boy. I mean, when I write those words out, it keeps my mind from getting occupied about all the crap that's going on. And then when it's time to engage, I engage. I think that also I sometimes do that just because it's like, I'm, you know, it looks like I'm doing something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I still pay attention and put the pen down, but it's a go-to move if I really feel like I'm getting distracted or tired or, or I'm nervous or anything like that. Um. <laughs> You'll see me furiously writing at times, and I use these big orange dots, and I'll put them on a piece of paper and write. That's because I have to write myself some notes, and I put those orange piece of paper, uh, those orange stickers on there because I'm going to use that and close an argument. You don't need to worry about that. If you see me reacting, don't judge. Don't think, oh my God, he thinks we're losing. I might think we're winning. Don't try to read my mind. Just be calm. Uh, might think that little orange paper looks cool up there. Yeah. So don't <laughs> don't don't prejudge. The the thing that I want to express to you about this trial is it is a marathon. Yeah. It is not a sprint. You got to be ahead at the finish line, not at the start line. And so don't worry if we start falling behind in your mind. As long as we catch up and cross that line first, we win. Yeah. And let me tell you something else. I'm often wrong, but never in doubt. And so if you see me in trial 
uh, getting red faced or acting mad. I, I probably am mad. That doesn't mean I'm mad at you. I may be, at, you know, Chris just talked to you about all the crap that's going on. One of the biggest craps that goes on is I believe opposing counsel may have violated a rule or misstated something or a witness lied about something that gets under my skin and it's hard for me to control it but that's motivation that's energy for me to represent you so don't take it personal uh, we'll be friends after it's over but during the heat of the battle i have to focus on what weapons i have available to me yeah so closing arguments um we get to go first in that we get to break it up so we get to go twice Typically, we get about 15, maybe 20 minutes. We can get longer if we really need it and judge grants it, but we'll reserve a portion of our allotted time for rebuttal. So say we get a total of 20 minutes, we'll do 15 minutes for the initial part of the opening where we have to, what's called fully open, I mean, yeah, fully open, mm -hmm. full open over the close, where we set forth the amount of money that we want and how we've proved the elements of our uh, case. And typically, and, and kind of talk about how the evidence has proved that. Then we'll sit down, and sometimes when we're trying cases together, we'll divide this up. We'll sit down. The defense gets to go, and they give their, they give their 20 minutes of talking about how we hadn't proved anything, and oh this and oh that. And then we get to do rebuttal for the remainder of our time. So in this scenario, five minutes. And this is t typically where we really try to bring it home. And you know, this is this, and this is where you see the righteous indignation, if if justified, and maybe some more emotion. And we tend to divide this up on the day of trial as well, trying to determine who's going to do what. And sometimes it's a kind of a feeling type thing, like, now nah, I'm really feeling the opening part today, or nah, I'd like to do the rebuttal. I've really got that, you know, I've worked on that, and I really feel that. After closing arguments, the judge will discharge the jury back to the room. They'll have those questions to answer until and give them their final like deliberation instructions, which is pretty short at this point. And they'll go back and then begins the most nerve wracking pro time of all. This is when we're waiting on a verdict. Yeah, I recommend Ooh. you bring a book. Yeah. Because we don't want to be, he and, and I are already tape. rehashing the trial and what we should have done and what we, you know, we don't need to be doing that as a group. It's not productive. <laughs> we just need to be relaxing. Now, sometimes the deliberations take a few minutes, sometimes they take days. Yeah. We don't know how long they take, so bring you a good book. Settle in. Our clients are going to say, "Yeah, but how?" But on a general note, how long does it take? Well, I don't know. A few hours for a car wreck, you know. Well, but I've gone a day and a half on a car wreck. My answer to that is, how long does it take to have a baby? I don't know. As long as it takes. Yeah. Till it's um, done. And like, there may be notes that come out uh, from the jury, and for the most part, the judge is going to say, well, "You have to obey the instructions that I gave you." Do not read anything into these notes unless the note says, can we award more than the plaintiff asked for? Because, Which I've gotten that note. Because, <laughs> I mean, I've, I've gotten plenty of notes and been, I, I swear I'm wrong more than I am right on what that note means. Well, see, I'm often wrong, but never in doubt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if, I think in a note that says we need a calculator might be a good sign. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know what? I... Man, we've won cases we should have lost, and lost cases we should have won. And it, at that point, we're just we've given it to the jury, and that's all we can do. And I can assure you that if you've got us, we've done everything we can to try your case as best as possible. And it doesn't mean you know even if there's a loss, doesn't mean that you were wrong. And if you didn't get as much money as you expected, doesn't mean you were wrong. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the wrong people got on that jury, or just you know shit happens. Uh, Eventually, the jury will come back with their verdict. You'll hear a ding, a bell. By the Unless way, it's a hung jury. Yeah. But by the way, during uh, deliberation, do not go like leave the premises without talking to us. I cannot, I've had it where the jury's come back and you want to see a pissed off judge, have the plaintiff be gone out playing tiddlywinks, doing no telling what, and doesn't even have their cell phone on them and we can't find them. Don't do that. Stick around. Now, the judge will let us know, like, hey, jury's going to take a break. Y'all can go. Or, or we're going to take a lunch break. We'll let you know about all that, but just do not disappear. We understand that you have maybe work, family obligations, this, that, and the other. We'll figure out something. Uh, directed, I mean, uh, hung jury 
In a trial of 12, you have to have at least 10 jurors agree on all the issues. In a jury of six, you have to have at least five. If you can't get five or 10, it, their jury's hung. And that's a process that we hope doesn't happen because nobody wants to try the case twice. Yeah. After the verdict's been given, the judge will do kind of like what you've seen um, in movies. He'll say, he'll have the lead juror stand up. Well, he'll read the verdict and for the plaintiff we find blah, blah, blah. And he'll read the split of negligence and, and he may stop after the first question if the defendant was not negligent, but then he'll read the damages. As a matter of professional courtesy, you're supposed to remain as stoic, I guess, as possible. Whether you do or don't, I can't say. Control yourself. Yeah. After the verdict, the judge, at least in state court, will allow us the opportunity to talk to the juror members, and some of them will stick around and they want to talk. Others do not. They want to go on with life, and we're not going to, we're not going to, they've done their civic duty, so we're not going to pressure them to talk to us. Um, you're welcome to talk to the juror members. Some of them, I mean, I've had some of them come up and just want to give my client, and, and give my client a hug because they feel so horrible about what my client's gone through. I'm sure you've seen that. Oh, yeah. I've also seen them go read the defendant, the riot act. Um, I, I always try to talk to the jury. That is the most priceless piece of the trial. How can I learn how to improve myself better than to have the people who just judge my client and my performance give me the feedback? Yeah. And that's the verdict, you know, and hopefully we've got a great, um, a great thing. After we got the verdict within 30 days, or as soon as possible, we'll ask for a judgment, which a judgment is the formalization of the verdict. It gives us the opportunity to collect uh, during that time, the defense or we could file a motion to set aside the verdict, meaning take judge, we think what the jury found here couldn't, uh, no reasonable juror could have found it based on this or based on that. Um, once a judgment is final, well, once a verdict becomes a judgment, the, the, the court holds on to it, what's called plenary power, and I'm not going to get into this too much, but after a amount of time, a certain amount of time that the judgment has been rendered, the judgment becomes final. But in that interim time, they can appeal it. We're not going to talk about appeals, but I'm just saying, yeah. you know, just know that that's a possibility. Um, you will get paid on this judgment as soon as we can get paid. We want to get the money in too. How long does that take? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's the, that's the question everybody wants to know. If, you know, for the most part, if, if it's been a reasonable verdict, now if we go ring the bell and we get millions of dollars, they're going to probably fight us on it, uh, unless barring unforeseen circumstances. But if it's a general car wreck and it's, in, it's within the policy limits, we're going to get the money within and pay you within 30 days. If it's an appeal, I don't know, a few years. For all of you who latched on to 30 days, we had an appeal that lasted seven years. Yeah. So it takes as long as it takes. That's best case scenario. So please don't come to me and say I said 30 days because I know right. I said that. But I'm saying best case scenario, right. um, we get it in 30 days. True. And that's about it for trial. Again, behave I, yourself, please. I have some uh, a couple of do's to don't. Don't whisper to me at council table. I can't hear you. Look at me. I'm old. <laughs> I need you to write me a note. If I can't read it, I don't know what you said. So it needs to be written plainly and clearly. I want to hear what your comments are, but please, and I'll provide you with note cards or a notebook for you to write me notes. It's okay for you to write me notes and I want to, but I cannot hear you because all of my energy is trained on listening to what that witness is saying. And so if you want to send me a note, that'd be fine, but don't whisper to me at council table. The next thing is, um, and this really is a problem in the courthouse. Don't be talking to your friend or your neighbor or calling somebody. I don't care if you're saying anything about your case or not. Let me give you an example. Hey, Bill, how are you doing today? I mean, talking like that in the courthouse is not appropriate. Nobody wants to hear your conversation, newsflash. And so do not be having these loud, obnoxious conversations in the courthouse which are going to be viewable by any of the jurors. And feel free to get on to me or Rafe if we do something like that. I shouldn't, but God forbid if I did, you can say, Chris, shh. We've got to remind each other, we're being judged from the time we leave our house till the time we get home after the trial's over. Yeah. That's about all I got, unless you got anything else. That's it. Well, I'm Chris Stoy. And I'm Rafe Foreman. And we're for Warriors for Justice, and we're here to help you. 
reach out to us. Let us know if you've got any questions or you can submit any inquiries that you have online at warriorsforjustice.com. Thanks.